Let's look at a better version of the Lorentz transformation. It's going to take a little bit of work to work up to it, but we're actually along the way. We're going to invent some wonderful stuff, um, which you may well have seen before. But if you haven't, this is going to be kind of a non-standard introduction to a nice little piece of mathematics. Um, I want to make one comment that's going to be necessary for a piece of the argument that makes sense to come out of this discussion that we had before. Um, this matrix, this has got this overall factor of gamma, 1 over root squared to 1 minus v squared times 1 vv1. Um, there's a nice thing about this matrix. The columns and rows of this matrix are uh, orthogonal unit vectors in, Minkows in the Minkowski sense. Clearly, if you take the dot product of 1 v and v1, that's 0, or 1 v v1 columns, that's 0. And let's look at the assertion that's a unit vector. Well, in fact, We've, we've pretty much already seen that. It kind of com comes out of the derivation. But I just want to just make sure that's really clear that uh, the magnitude of 1v over root 1 minus v squared, well, the 1 over root 1 minus v squared comes out, and it's just the magnitude of 1v. Well, that's where that gamma factor came from in the first place. It's the square root of 1 minus v squared equals 1. Okay? So these guys are unit vectors. And so even if we didn't have that formula for it. Even if we just knew, we know it's of this form, that it's A, B, B, A. And that's what we're going to start with. We know that it's of this form, and we want to express those as in a, in a better way, as functions of some new parameter that's not V. We know that um, the columns and rows are orthogonal, and they're unit vectors. So in particular, A squared minus B squared is equal to 1. Uh -huh. <coughs> and so that's going to be something we're going to use. Now, here's, that's, a, that's a sort of a side idea that we're going to use pretty soon. Here's the basic idea of trying to figure out a better way to figure out the Lorentz transformations. It's to look at um, this, these two coordinate systems and say, is there anything that they are going to agree on? And of course, I've given you a big hint by drawing the null cone. They are going to agree about the null cone. So that means that if I take a Lorentz transformation, and I hit it with, say, the null vector 1, 1. That had better be a null vector again. Even according to x prime and t prime, it had better uh, have the form something and itself. The, 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 the top and bottom components have got to be equal. Well, we can check that. We know it has this form from what we've seen before, a, b, b, a. And indeed, that's just a plus b, b plus a. OK. So that's a check that they are going to agree on the null cone. But we can get a lot more out of it by saying, OK, this number, the sum of these, each row or each column, that looks is starting to look like a very interesting thing to measure. And in fact, what it, what it measures is given a null vector described as 1, 1 in the xt coordinates, it describes the, the b observer, the x prime, t prime observer, his view or her view of what that vector is. It's got the same structure that the, the top and bottom are the same, so it's a null vector, but the components have changed to a plus b. What we're going to discover later <coughs> is that that actually corresponds to the red shift or blue shift of a photon. Okay, so this is the big hint that we would like to, to look at a plus b. Okay, uh, and so what we're just going to do is call this z. Okay, we're going to say z is this a plus b factor. And now I'm going to go back to the, what was a problem before. I'm going to look at, um, let me set this up here. I'm going to look at two Lorentz transformations, let's say L1 and L2. And I'm just going to put them in as A1, B1, B1, A1. We're not sure exactly how to express those. We're just going to remember that the structure of the Lorentz transformation is that these two are equal and these two are equal. That's not all we know about it, but. That's all we need to do, know right now. And I'm going to multiply those two Lorentz transformations. I know that ends up with some other Lorentz transformation, a3, b3, b3, a3. And the problem was when I expressed everything in terms of v's, the formula for the v that corresponded to L3 was ugly. And in particular, it wasn't just addition. Okay, So I'm just going to do this matrix multiplication. That's a1, a2, plus b1, b2. This is a1, b2, plus b1, a2. 
and then similarly a1b2 plus b1a2 that those have to be equal and a1a2 plus b1b2 if you check it it does work out okay and so now I'm just going to calculate the z quantities here z1 is just a1 plus b1 z2 is a2 plus b2 now this lets me calculate z3 a3 plus b3 in terms of the a1 and a2 and if this hint that looking at the null cone was a good idea pans out this might behave in a better way and it is going to behave in a better way it's very cool how it works out just stare at that for a minute pause the video if you want stare at that and see if there's another way to write that combination of four quantities and indeed there is it's just a1 plus b1 times a2 plus b2 it's just z1 times z2 now this is a little disappointing because that's multiplication we were hoping to get some way of describing this transformation uh, and this transformation and this transformation so that it added so that the number we were associating to L1 and the number we were associating to L2 just added up to be the number associated L3 we haven't found that but we still found something very simple and how on earth do you turn multiplication into addition that is a good thing to think about there is a wonderful operation that turns multiplication into addition and that's taking the logarithm okay so we're gonna say alpha is defined to be the ln and of course we use the ln here we don't use this we want to use the natural logarithm it's better behaved is the ln of z or in other words z is e to the alpha okay and so if we take the ln of this multiplicativity equation ln of that is ln of this we get alpha 3 is ln z1 plus ln z2 because the logarithm of a product is the sum of the logs and that's just alpha 1 plus alpha 2 so it turns out to be the ln so the alpha we've defined it as if you've got a Lorentz transformation you just look at the two distinct numbers that you see in there you add it and you take the ln and you call it alpha we're gonna discover more about what alpha really means very soon okay um, so let's see if we can say a little bit more about alpha and how it relates to a and b and eventually to v and that kind of thing okay but with this is really the big breakthrough is we found an additive parameter that this number does add okay so now here what I, is what I rem want to remember that a squared minus b squared remember that's one and that that factors one reason that's really useful is oh hey here's z okay so z is not only a plus b it's also also one over a minus b so in other words a minus b is one over z okay that's e to the minus alpha and of course the definition was a plus b is z and that's e to the plus alpha ah that's nice that allows us to solve for a and b okay so what we can do here is what we're basically figuring out is how to invert this um, this says if you tell me the Lorentz transformation of interest which you could get maybe from a velocity description here's how to get this weird number alpha which we're gonna have a name for soon but we'd also like to go back and forth back for, and forth we'd like to be able to go the other direction and this is gonna allow us to do that we can just add those equations together we get 2a is the sum of these guys or in other words a is e to the alpha plus e to the minus alpha over 2 and b you take this equation minus this equation and divide by 2 e the alpha minus e to the minus alpha over 2 now this is where that should look familiar if you've ever seen what are called the hyperbolic trig functions okay and with and I think it's really kind of neat by just looking at the null cone being a little clever in a couple places and looking for additivity we've actually rediscovered um, the hyperbolic trig functions or discovers them for the first time okay so one thing that's um, really important about these guys is that if I take any number alpha and produce this weird combination of exponentials and this weird combination call it, call them a and b 
then one thing that's guaranteed is that a squared minus b squared is equal to 1. You can actually reverse these steps. Trust me on that. You can also, also just grind it out. Okay. And remember what this is. This is saying that a comma b is a unit vector in Minkowski space. Or, to put it much uh, in a more uh, down-to-earth terms, it's a hyperbola. It's the unit hyperbola. So one thing about these functions of alpha is that no matter what alpha you plug in, if you plot the point a comma b, it's going to be, it's actually over here, because this is always a positive quantity. So it's one branch of the unit hyperbola. Okay, and so that's very analogous to having a cool way of tracing out the unit circle. Remember one idea, one way to describe cosine theta and sine theta is that they trace out the unit circle. Well, there's even more you can say about cosine theta and sine theta, which is really what what their significance was in a couple of videos ago. If you use cosine theta and sine theta, uh, for example, you can think of that as take this point and rotate it around by an angle theta. And that has two very, very important properties. One is that you end up on the unit circle, of course, because it's a rotation. And so this unit vector turns into this unit vector. But it also has the additivity property. If you do theta and then you do phi, then the total is theta plus phi. It's additive. Well, that's what's true here, but for Minkowski geometry. Here, if you start out with 1, 0, and you put in an alpha, you get some point on the unit hyperbola, guaranteed, because a squared minus b squared is equal to 1. But what we've discovered is if you then, that's alpha 1, say, and then you do an alpha 2, then the sum of that is the same as if you did, did alpha 3. Okay, And so, so Lorentz transformations and hyperbolas are exactly analogous to rotations and the unit circle. Okay, so because of that analogy, we are completely justified in having some terminology for this. We say cosh, the hyperbolic cosine, you pronounce it cosh alpha, is defined to be this, and cinch alpha is defined to be this. And they have exactly analogous properties for Minkowski geometry that cosine theta and sine theta have for Euclidean geometry. They go on a hyperbola, and they are additive under the transformations that are appropriate, namely the Lorentz transformations here. And so now we can summarize. Using those definitions of the functions, we can summarize. Remember, A, putting in the A and B, it says the Lorentz transformation matrix can be written in a very nice way that's exactly analogous to... Euclidean rotation matrix. L, given this funky number alpha, which again, we still need to understand a little bit more about how to get alpha, things like that. Here's one way, but there's other ways. Um, given that number alpha, which is this new way of describing how, basically how fast something is going, what's what the, uh, Lorentz, the magnitude of Lorentz transformation, then the actual Lorentz transformation matrix is very beautiful. It's cosh, cinch, cinch, cosh. No, no, there's no minus sign. Um, because these always are equal, these are equal, no, no change in sign like there is in the um, Euclidean case. Um, and this guy is automatically engineered to both be a Lorentz, a legal Lorentz transformation, and so that L alpha 1, L alpha 2 is guaranteed to be L alpha, th uh, alpha 3, where alpha 3 is alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Okay, so alpha goes by a couple different names. It's often called the velocity parameter because it has something to do with velocity, and we'll see exactly what it is in a second. Um, alpha, it's not the honest to God usual notion of velocity, but you can call it a velocity parameter. And it's sometimes called the rapidity because that's just a synonym for velocity, roughly. Okay. And what is it in terms of V? Well, that's easy. Remember how you got V from a Lorentz transformation? You took this and divided by this. Because remember, this is still equal. This isn't wrong, it's just not as elegant. So the, the ratio of this over this is still v. And so we, what we get is that the velocity is the tanch. By definition, that's the, the ratio of cinch over cosh of alpha. Okay, And so that's one way of, of having the relationship. And then, of course, alpha is the inverse hyperbolic tangent of v. So that's one way to, to, to calculate it inverse hyperbolic tangent. Another way is from this formula, 
and it really actually it gives you just an equivalent way of expressing inverse hyperbolic tangent. Remember a, so alpha is the ln, a is just gamma, and then b is gamma v, so gamma 1 plus v. So if somebody's already calculated, you already have v, and then it's easy to calculate gamma, then this is a way to calculate the alpha, the, the rapidity. Okay? But that's just a, this is just a, a nice elegant way of, you know, it turns out that if you really un unravel all the definitions, it turns out that that's uh, the same as the inverse hyperbolic tangent. So what it's really saying, though, is that for a lot of uh, purposes, v just isn't the right thing to describe. Um, this addition of velocities rule is so pretty and so nice, it's very tempting to say, you know, as much as possible, I'm going to try and describe relative motion in terms of alpha uh, instead of v. That's like saying I want to describe rotations in terms of theta in, in the angle instead of the slope. Uh, there's some real advantage to that. Okay. So one thing I want to I want to do a couple more things here. Um, I'm not going to give you a whole lesson on hyperbolic functions right here. Maybe I'll do that at some point, other point. Oh, actually, I might have it somewhere. You can search. I can't even remember. Um, I do want to graph real quick the relationship, the qualitative relationship between uh, alpha and v. Um, that's e to the alpha plus, no, sorry, minus e to the minus alpha over e to the alpha plus e to the minus alpha. The over 2s cancel out. And what happens here is that if alpha gets very, very, very big, these die, and this approaches 1. So as alpha gets very, very big, you get an asymptote at v equals 1. Hey, that makes sense, because if alpha is an additive parameter, there's nothing to keep it from going off to infinity. If I boost by alpha equals 1, and then boost again by alpha equals 1, and then boost again by alpha equals 1, I'm just going to add those up. And you might think, whoa, wait, I thought velocities weren't supposed to add. But alpha can go off to plus infinity, no problem. But that doesn't mean the velocity, the ordinary kind of Newtonian idea of velocity is going off to infinity. By this formula, it's going up to exactly the asymptote it should have, which is the speed of light. It never quite gets there. And then it's an odd function. It's not hard to show that. And it has an asymptote of minus 1 over here. When alpha is a very big negative number, it's these that die, these that live, and you basically get a minus 1. And so for alpha going off to minus infinity, the rapidity going to minus infinity, that's going uh, almost to the speed of light in the other direction. Okay. Let me close this out by going back to z. Uh, z, remember, was just e to the alpha. That's um, a plus b. So there's a nice relationship between this new funky parameter, which we're not really used to, but has some really wonderful properties, including basically the, mainly the additivity. And then there's this funky z quantity, which has something to do with how, you, how light transforms, how uh, two different people interpret the same null vector, the same light-like vector. It's got a very simple description in terms of alpha. It's just e to the alpha. It's equal to a plus b, the sum of e either the rows or columns, e one row or one column of the uh, matrix. That's equal to the gamma times the quantity 1 plus v. And if you actually work that out, it's not hard to show that you get a little bit of a cancellation. And it's the square root of 1 plus v over 1 minus v. And so that's another quantity. And it turns out that that's going to be really useful um, for a little bit more physics.